Welcome to week three of the President's Athletic Conference Football Focus. I'm Waynesburg University senior Andy Stanko, and this week our focus shifts to the Grove City College Wolverines. Grove City is one of two PAC schools that is breaking in a new head coach for the 2016 season. Record-setting quarterback Andrew DiDonato now patrols the sidelines for the Wolverines, who are looking to improve after consecutive winless campaigns. Up next for Grove City is the PAC Conference opener against Case Western Reserve, under the lights at Robert E. Thorne Field. Each week, the PAC Football Focus features one team from around the conference. We'll take a look into the program and highlight Saturday's matchups to get you ready for the weekend with the PAC pregame show following the Football Focus. Two other Waynesburg University students and I will break down every matchup involving PAC teams in Week 3. Coach Andrew DiDonato is no stranger to Grove City football. He quarterbacked the Wolverines for a school record 40 games from 2006 through 2009 and owns career and season records in passing, completions, and touchdown passes. In his senior season, Grove City finished 4-2 in PAC play for the program's best conference record in almost a decade. Coach DiDonato enjoyed great individual and team success as a player, and he now relishes the opportunity to lead the next generation of Grove City football. It's a blessing for sure to be back at the alma mater, and like I shared on media day as we were getting ready for camp and being on campus and reflecting upon my wife who lived in the dorm or in the apartments that overlooked the field and going through the field house and seeing pictures of my brother or my parents from the night game it is a reminder of how blessed we are my wife and I to be back at a place that we love and a place that we call home and and my brother and I both had great experiences playing football Grove City were a part of teams that that found some success and that is what we're trying to get back to and and what we're doing with our guys is we've just really outlined a very clear vision for where we want to go as a program and outlined the process it's going to take to turn that vision into a reality and created a culture of love knowing that the only way we do it is everybody working together and being on board with one another and that vision process and love is the formula for us to get back to where we want to be at Grove City and to do special things within this program and it certainly is an honor to get to do it at a place that I love very much. Coach DiDonato joined Grove City's coaching staff last season as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach and was named the coach in waiting to take over the program after the retirement of longtime head coach Chris Smith. The year on staff is paying dividends for Coach DiDonato in his first season as a head coach. There's many benefits to it from the physical side, but really the greatest benefit from the in-waiting process was the administrative side of things. And as you take over, I've always been told that when you take over as a head coach for the first time, and nothing really prepares you for it, no matter how much preparation you put into it, nothing prepares you for the many things that you face as a head football coach. And and being in the head coach and waiting process with Coach Smith, it was a great benefit to be alongside of him and work with him, a man I love for his final year. But the greatest benefit personally would be just the administrative side of things, the day-to-day things that you have to do as a head coach, things that I would have had to learn myself through trial and error. I got outlined for me by Coach Smith and got to see him do it for a full year. So many great benefits, but the administrative side of things would certainly be one of them. Inheriting a football team trying to return to prominence in the PAC, Coach DiDonato took a very deliberate approach to improving the players he already had on campus and recruiting talented players from around the area. We knew coming in when you take over a program, there's two areas you really got to focus on. And one is strength and conditioning, the development of your current players and putting them in the best position possible physically by making them bigger, faster, stronger, all of those elements. So that was part one, was really get a solid strength program going. And the second piece of that was recruiting. How are we going about bringing new players into the program? And, and there's no secret recipe other than hard work and building relationships and all of those things necessary. And uh, bless how the Lord works that my I got some sales experience while I was coaching at the high school level and then recruiting experience when I was at the college. And, and we have a staff of two former head coaches. So we put together a very detailed plan for how we'd approach recruiting and how we would outline our areas and be intentional and and what we're looking for in a student athlete. And 
for myself, I played in Western Pennsylvania in the Whippeo. I coached in the Whippeo. I was blessed to be at South Fayette and have success as a coach and being a part of that staff with Joe Rossi. And that certainly was a focus for us. And and it's neat that we were able to get some impact guys from the Whippeo to come in as freshmen and really help. Coach Steve Donato singled out the senior class at Grove City for setting an example and embracing the culture that is Grove City football. I am so proud of our seniors and the way they responded when we took over in November and then Coach Hoyt in January. Coach Hoyt's our defensive coordinator and strength coach, and we really got the strength program going in January, not only hiring a full-time strength coach, but also having assistance for him, and, and that's one of the two parts I mentioned earlier. It's developing our current players and recruiting new players into the program to go along with it. And the way the seniors have set the tone with the new expectation from the strength standpoint and just the detailed work of a new strength staff and how they've approached that side of side of things has been neat to see. And that starts with the seniors. So they know that it's a process to get to where we want to go. Obviously, when you face adversity, it's not a flip the switch, just overnight everything's going to change. It's a process. And as we tell them, they're laying the foundation for where we want to go and what they do every single day. And they've been leaders in the areas of strength and conditioning, leaders and bringing our young guys along. And they have certainly set the tone in our first year here of what we're, what the expectation is of a Grove City College football player, and I'm very proud of this class. We have guys like Brett Pinson on offense, Jeff Kroll defense, midside check offensive line, Dan Dorman defensive line. Those are four guys who, some specific guys that have really stepped up and have represented us as captains these first two weeks. And, and it's really been just their involvement and approach in the weight room in the off season, and then also during camp. In week one, Grove City nearly knocked off Juniata College thanks to the play of freshman quarterback Brett LaFoon and first-year wide receiver Nick Ponikbar. As freshmen, both earned starting spots out of camp. Both guys are from Western PA, so we got to see a lot of them. Nick, I actually knew real well from my coaching experience at the high school level, and, and Brett LaFoon was a player that caught a lot of attention here in his final two years of high school as well. And both of those guys came from very similar systems in high school. So as you watch their tape, we knew that we were going to be asking them to do things that they're very familiar with in that they ran the same type of scheme at the high school level. So you knew that the learning curve for them wouldn't be as steep being that they ran a similar offense in high school and they displayed the capabilities to execute what they've been asked to do at a high level based on their film. So we knew that they were very talented and we knew that they ran a similar scheme, but the question is how long until they're able to do it here at that level. And during camp, they came in very focused, very ready to compete. And both of them demonstrated early on to us that what we saw on their film is a reflection of what they can do at the college level as well. And being that they came in understanding this type of offense, what we ask our receivers to do or what we ask our quarterbacks to do, they they demonstrated those abilities quickly, which earned them the right to to be in the lineup day one. And, and they both displayed that in, in their performances day one. And it's something that we just got to continue to refine and get better at each week. But both of them did the things in camp necessary to earn that opportunity. Grove City's early season schedule pitted the Wolverines against one of the top returning quarterbacks in the PAC to open the season. Last week, Washington and Jefferson's Pete Coughlin threw seven first-half touchdowns against the Wolverines in a 65-13 win for W&J. Coach DiDonato is looking for progress in the process each week. The key for us is process right now, and we talk about vision, process, and love. It's each guy doing their job every play and we are not we need to get to the point where we execute all 11 doing their assignment at a high level every single play and and that's the work in progress when you are installing new systems you have a lot of young guys it's it's being able to execute what you're trying to do at a high level every play and that's what we're focused on right now that's what we take from week two of a very good football team, when we don't do our job the way we're supposed to all 11, 
a great football team is going to exploit that. And that's what WNJ did at times on Saturday. They're, they're a top 25 team for a reason, and they're able to take advantage of things if you have any breakdowns. And as you're rebuilding, that's really one of the areas is just focus on the process. So that's what we took from we two is areas where we need to get better at in our process. And that's something that we've been addressing this week and something we'll continue to work on as we continue throughout the season. Next up for Grove City is the Case Western Reserve Spartans. And the challenge is to defend all PAC first team quarterback Rob Kuda and Case Western's explosive offense. Two weeks in a row, we play two very talented quarterbacks in this conference, obviously playing WNJ last week and now Case this week. They have two of the top, top QBs uh, in the area for a reason. They're very talented young men, and certainly we have that challenge again this week, and it's really no different. The message stays the same. It's we're going to have specific assignments that we have to execute, and it's going to take all 11 to do their job to be able to perform at a high level to compete against a talented quarterback. And that's our focus this week is we know that they have a lot of talent on the field starting at the quarterback position, and we have to make sure that we execute our assignments every play and we get that out of all 11 because he's a very talented young man, and if you have any breakdowns, he's going to find it and he will exploit it. So that's the focus for us this week, and, and that's what we're doing here throughout practice. Week three's matchup with Case Western is the lone night game for Grove City at home this season. As a player, Coach DiDonato played in the first ever night game at Grove City and understands what that experience means for its players, university, and community. My sophomore year was the first ever night game at Grove City, and I remember playing Waynesburg, and they scored with about 13 seconds left to win that game, and I remember the heartbreaker that that was, but it was the first ever night game, and it was special to to get to play in a memorable experience like that for our program and for our school. And the next year, my junior year, we played Bethany and it was 30, I think 33, 30 at halftime. It was all offense in the first half. And the second half, there was one score where we were down at halftime, but we were able to score in the fourth quarter to win that game. And being a part of the first two night games and being on the losing end of a heartbreaker and then winning a close game. Both of those are two highlights when I think back to my playing career. So very memorable experience as a player playing in the night game at Grove City and now being back coaching in it. It's it's a special night for the campus and the community and very honored to serve on this end for such a special evening. And I'm looking greatly forward to Saturday night under the lights. Coach DiDonato's name is etched all over the Grove City record books for his accomplishments as a quarterback, and he believes that his young QB has the capacity to lead his program to success. Coach DiDonato said that he wouldn't mind if one day his quarterback broke some of his records. You know, we don't talk much about individual awards or statistics or anything like that, but I know we have a very special young man, a quarterback, and there's nothing I would enjoy more for ever, anything that I've done to be wiped away and erased than someone else's name there. And he's a very talented young man and certainly would have, if he continues to do his job and work hard and stay healthy and keep doing the things that we've seen here in the first couple of weeks, he, I'd be very happy to see him uh, right, take all those and wipe them away. But like I said, we don't focus too much on the individual accomplishments or awards. I know his focus is – is to turn this program around and put wins up on the board and get us closer towards that vision that we have set forth for the program. And he's a young man who is a very special leader for us for these first couple of weeks. And we're looking forward to him not only continue to be successful in his role as quarterback, but also lead us in many ways. And, and we're excited to see his growth and development as he just continues to get more and more experience here at the college level. Thanks to Andrew DiDonato and Grove City College for being on the PAC Football Focus. Up next week is Geneva College and longtime head coach Gino DeMarco. Stay tuned for the PAC pregame show coming up next on PACathletics.org. I'm Joe Anderko, Commissioner of the President's Athletic Conference. Want to know what makes the PAC so special? Here's a few reasons why. 
Comprised of 10 private institutions and two affiliate members, the PAC remains unique in this era of high-pressure college athletics. Now sponsoring 21 sports as it celebrates over 60 years of competition, the PAC is regarded as one of the elite NCAA Division III conferences in the nation. Our student-athletes excel in athletics as well as the classroom, with numerous postgraduate scholarship winners, over 150 academic All-Americans, and over 900 academic honorable recipients with a 3.6 GPA or higher in the past year alone. Want to learn more? Visit us at www.pacathletics.org or follow the President's Athletic Conference on social media. Academic and athletic excellence since 1955, the President's Athletic Conference. Welcome to the PAC pregame show here on PACathletics.org. Andy Stanko with you today with two other Waynesburg University seniors, Zach Ziegler, Brendan Keeney, and guys, taking a look back at an exciting week two in PAC play. Quite a few eventful games. Anything in particular stand out to you gentlemen? I mean, to me, I really like the close game between St. Vincent and Teal. Didn't expect that here in week two of the season. It was a really fun game. 32-30, to St. Vincent came out. I really thought Teal showed some fight in that game, and that was one of my favorite games of week two. Yeah, I think every single game had something that you could take away from it. Uh, Thomas Moore rebounding, uh, getting their first win of the season over Bridgewater in a blowout, 41-7. to and then uh, W and J absolutely lighting up the scoreboard, 65-13 over Grove City. Uh, they look to be back as one of the premier offensive powerhouses in the PAC this season. And then I think, uh, Zach, that was a great observation. Teal played really well in week one against Allegheny, beat them, and then made it really close against St. Vincent. So they're definitely a team to be reckoned with. They can, they can surprise a few teams this year, it looks like. Uh, and then Geneva, of course, shutting out Bethany in Geneva, where they have been so good in the past. So good for Geneva, winning 21 to nothing. Uh, despite the passing game, they did really well on the ground. And that was actually a really close game. Uh, zeros across the board until the fourth quarter. So interesting game there in Geneva, but Geneva able to squeak it out. The, the cream of the crop in the PAC took care of business. No case, no CMU, both on buys in week number two. And you saw... Westminster's defense just suffocate Waynesburg's offense. You saw W&J's offense, seven touchdown passes in the first half for Pete Coughlin, and then Thomas Moore just in all facets bouncing back after a heartbreaking loss to Franklin. And uh, there might be a little bit of a, a PAC football focus curse brewing after Thomas Moore lost in week one. Bethany goes into Geneva, and the Golden Tornadoes just take care of business in week two, really wearing down the Bison. So that, that'll be a storyline to watch here in week three, uh, especially with Grove City taking on Case Western. And let's jump right in to week three slate of games. Getting started with the, a noon kickoff, and this has been your de facto PAC championship game the last couple of seasons. Number 23 W&J at number 20 Thomas Moore in Crestview Hills, Kentucky. Either the Saints or the Presidents have represented the PAC in the Division Three National Championship every single season since 2006. Thomas Moore, of course, coming off an unbeaten regular season and outright PAC title, and W&J had represented the PAC in the three seasons before last year. And you look at these teams coming into it, they've really dominated the rest of the conference. The only PAC team that Thomas Moore has lost to since 2012 is W&J. W&J has only losses to Bethany in 2013, Waynesburg in 2014, and Case Western in 2015 outside of Thomas Moore. In every case, the win over Jay was the signature moment for each of those teams, so these these guys have been at the top of the conference, and in the last four meetings dating back to 2012, the home team has won every single time and won by a comfortable margin. WJ's won 45 21 in Cameron Stadium, 51 28 in Washington, and Thomas Moore the last two meetings, 54 18 Saints, and then 38 20 last season. So, guys, WJ, Thomas Moore, so early in the season, what do we see in this matchup? I mean, you talked about it, Andy. These two are the cream of the crop when it comes to the PAC. If you're preparing for these teams, these are the two games you circle on your schedule. So it's going to be a clash of titans, as always. You have the top rusher here in the PAC, C.J. Tarrant, through two weeks, has 328 yards rushing versus the top quarterback in the PAC, 
and Pete Coughlin for W and J. So it's really going to be a battle of offense. It's here going to be who can shut down the other team's strength. If W can W and J can handle the run game for Thomas Moore, it could go W and J's way. If Thomas Moore can handle the passing game, it's going to go more towards Thomas Moore. So it's going to be a battle of which team could shut down the other team's strength. you got to circle that one guy on the roster that you got to take care of, take care of him, and the rest will just fall into place. It's going to be a very good matchup. Interested to see what happens in that one. Yeah, I think this game is going to be a shootout. And given the way that both offenses played last week, Thomas Moore, 634 yards of total offense. And then the same thing with W&J. They absolutely lit up the scoreboard, as you mentioned earlier, Andy. And they had a, a ton of yards as well. And you said that the home field advantage, I wonder if there is a significant home field advantage, especially since Thomas Moore We've well, got the travel time. Exactly, so that's, what I'm, that's exactly what I'm going yeah. for. Uh, so I wonder if that has been some of, uh, you mentioned the past four seasons, the home team has won. Um, but one thing I do want to mention, though, as Westminster has become more competitive, Carnegie Mellon uh, has become competitive, competitive, and then Case Western, the emergence of that team in the PAC. I don't think you can necessarily look at this game as a de facto PAC championship yeah, last game Last year anymore. it wasn't. Correct. On the final weeks of the season, it was W&J and Case Western in Case Western. That was one of the, the big deciding Thomas games. Thomas Moore Case Western was a huge game uh -huh. as well. Uh, so I definitely think this is a huge game. Obviously, two of the top four teams probably in the conference playing against each other. I think it's going to be a lot of offense, and I really like the way Pete Coughlin's throwing the ball. He had another fantastic game. Jesse Zubik is playing tremendously for that team as well. So I think it's going to be a high-scoring affair. Zach, I think you hit the nail right on the head when the key for WJ is shutting down C.T. Terrence. The key for Thomas Moore is getting... Pete Coughlin to turn the football over. You look at last season, the 38-20 win for Thomas Moore in Crestview Hills. A close game going into the fourth quarter. The Saints held a 24-20 lead. Thomas Moore was able to score twice in drives that began from Pete Coughlin interceptions. And you look at the, the story of that game. Thomas Moore outrushed W&J 220 to 110 yards. Five yards of carry for Thomas Moore versus three yards of rush for W&J. Ryan Ruffing held to just 53 yards, his lowest rushing total all season. And here's, here's the big key from that game. The ball was put in the hands of Pete Coughlin for WJ. He threw for 360 yards, but one touchdown and four interceptions. WJ's offense got in the red zone four times, 13 points, missed field goal, field goal, field goal, touchdown. On the other side, CT Tarrant racked up almost 200 yards on the ground on five yards of carry, a couple of touchdowns. And Jensen Gebhardt, 13 for 16, 190, three touchdowns and an interception. Goose Cohorn, two touchdowns. For Thomas Moore, they got a complete game out of their offense. WJ turned the football over. But Pete Coughlin is the key. You mentioned him, Zach. The year before, WJ won at Cameron Stadium 51 28. Pete Coughlin, this is perhaps the best performance any player, even better than, than Pete Coughlin against w, or Grove City last week because of the competition. 25 for 35, 383, six touchdowns, no interceptions against Thomas Moore as a sophomore to beat the Saints. That's that's in terms of big time performance. It's Rob Kuda last year against WJ and it's that game. So I, I look for really Pete Coglin to be the difference one way or the other. Yeah, and Brendan Keeney hit it on the head. It's gonna be it's gonna be a close game either way. Both Taron and Coughlin are going to be the keys to the game. I think it's going to be a shootout. It could come down to who gets the ball last in this ball game, with how good both these offenses are. They're the top two teams of the PAC, and they're going to show it again this week. And let's not ignore Brennan Kuntz either for Thomas Moore. And then I think it's funny. Last week, Andy, we mentioned that uh, with the uh, with Goose Colhorn leaving, you know, there was. It was up to someone in the receiving core to step up and try to take over that number one overall spot uh, as a wide receiver. And then Dalen Garland, what a game he turned in. Seven receptions, 203 yards, three touchdowns. And then the big playability for Thomas Moore's offense will be huge because they're going to have to match the big playability by W&J. W&J, they had three offensive plays the first three offensive plays in the game they had 116 yards and two touchdowns that is the definition of big playability and that's going to be key for thomas moore to be able to match uh w and j punch for punch oh, both of these teams were excellent last week in terms of of offensive output thomas moore 318 yards on the ground 316 yards through the air 11 for 15 on third down three 80 plus yard touchdown drives in the first half Three drives of at least 10 plays to milk the clock in the second half, and all three backs between 10 and 15 carries, eight yards a rush, six yards a rush, seven yards a rush. You mentioned the day from Dalen Garland. That's what you're looking for. Because this matchup happens so early in the season, 
it'll be interesting to see who breaks out in this game because Thomas Moore is existing just really for the first time these last couple of games without Goose Cohorn, without Eric Butler on the defensive side of the football, without Jensen Gebhardt, who's been the starting quarterback the last couple of years. And for W and J, really, it was a well-oiled machine yesterday. We were impressed with the 30-point third quarter that W and J put up in week one. Well, they came back around with a 30-point first quarter last week against Grove City College. And, and the way that W and J did it, Scoring seven of the first eight offensive possessions, touchdowns, and no scoring drive for WJ in the first half lasted longer than six plays or a minute and 44 seconds. They scored quickly, they took advantage, they made big plays, and really, this, this is one of the premier games in the conference. Who's ready to play in this game? For WJ, I look at the running back position. Who's going to step up for Thomas Moore? I look at that defense. And does Pete Coglin have another statement ready for Thomas Moore? But we'll move on from that big-time matchup. Major D3Football.com ranking implications with the Saints and WJ. The only two teams getting vote or in the top 25. You've got Case Western and Westminster also receiving votes as well. We go to a 1 o'clock kickoff in Greenville, Pennsylvania, where it's Bethany traveling to Teal for the PAC opener. Last season, Bethany won this matchup 51-16 to in Bethany, and the Bison led 35-3 to at the half. Eric Blinn on the day, 12 catches, 185, three touchdowns, a rushing touchdown. Lincoln Reyes threw for 244 yards and just one interception. So those guys, out of the picture now for Bethany. Jalen Holmes still racked up 166 yards, two touchdowns, 16 or 14 yards of carry, a long touchdown run on Bethany's second play from scrimmage. And really for Bethany last season, when there's only one turnover, that was a win for the Bison, and that's exactly what they did. And on the other side, Ryan Radke, 19 for 37, 191 yards, two touchdowns through the air, gained 83 yards rushing on 17 carries before he had yards subtracted for sacks. And Bethany, seven touchdowns. Teal only entered the red and entered the red zone once of Teal defensively, and it tells me that Bethany beat Teal with big plays and touchdowns longer than 20 yards. So the Bison got the better of the Tomcats the first time around, or this time around last year. But a lot has changed in uh, the 2016 season. I mean, the key for me in this game is going to be that offensive line. But I think Bethany, every time we've prepared for them, we've had defense on the mind. Donovan Hayden, a very good defensive end for Bethany. you got to be able to contain him. He leads the league this year for through the first two games, 27 total tackles on the defensive side. So you got to contain him. And Bethany does have a very good offense. They can drive the ball down the field methodically. So you got to be able to stop them. Teal played well against St. Vincent last week. They're going to have to play another good game here against Bethany this week. As you said, Ryan Radke, the quarterback position, a guy who can move around a lot. So we'll see if he can maybe tire out Donovan Hayden and slow down that Bethany defense, confuse them just a little bit. Yeah, you mentioned Bethany can have a good offense that can be methodical down the field. And I look at the stats, and when I see Jalen Holmes having 22 carries, 121 yards, I'm sorry, 105 yards, it, it's still a good day for him. He averaged 4.8 yards a carry. And it's hard to imagine that if you get that kind of production out of Jalen Holmes that you can get shut out. And that's going to be a key to watch in this game. Teal, as an offense, has been playing very well in the early going. 28 points last week. They scored in the 40s against Allegheny. Uh, Ryan Radke, as you mentioned, Andy, has been sensational thus, thus far uh, in the season. So it's going to be interesting. This was a Teal team that has struggled in recent years, but they seem to have found their mojo here a little bit, especially in the first two weeks of the season. I think this is going to be a very good game, and Ryan Radke may have a lot to do with the outcome of it. I look at Bethany and I see Chase Keenman through two games as a starter for Coach Bill Garvey's squad. Under five yards per pass attempt. Mm -hmm. Didn't throw the ball down the field in Bethany's win over Ursinus College when the defense had seven takeaways. But Coach Garvey, last week when we talked to him, he said he wanted to get the ball downfield more. And that didn't really happen in week two against Geneva. 17 for 35, 100 yards, no touchdowns, one interception. Bethany and Geneva are the only two teams that don't have a passing touchdown through two weeks, and Geneva runs a triple option. That's that's pretty much by design. Bethany does have a playmaker in Tyler Ambush, and I think the Bison need to find ways to get the ball into his hands. And it's especially hard now with the absence of Eric Blinn, who's been such a good player for such a long time for that Bison team. And Zach, you mentioned Donovan Hayden. 17 tackles last week against Geneva. Charles Blango, 10 tackles, 3 for loss, 2 and a half sacks. The defense had three takeaways. The defense, year after year after year, for Bethany, Coach Garvey has his guys ready to play and brings in talented players, but the defense wore down in the fourth quarter. Bethany was on the field for 35 minutes, gave up a touchdown on a short field, but all things considered, gave the Bison a chance to win last week against Geneva, but just weren't able to get it done. 
On the other hand, Teal against St. Vincent fell behind early, down 20 to 7, down 23 to 10, battled back to tie the game at 23 with an extra point attempt to take the lead in the final seconds of the first half and really the turning point of the game. Blocked extra point, returned for two for St. Vincent. St. Vincent and Teal each score once more, and that extra point ends up being the difference. And uh, for Teal, Ryan Radke ruined a day where he threw for 219 yards, two touchdowns, ran for another 114 yards, including a 60-yard touchdown. It's like and, a perfect day for him. Yeah, it, the best of both worlds. Right. And, and he was under control, didn't turn the football over, found Eugene Bailey and Deshaun Bracey a number of times. Bailey, over 100 yards receiving, six catches, 103. Deshaun Bracey, two catches, 56 yards, touchdowns of 37 and 19 yards. Hmm. That's one thing that, that this Teal team has been missing the last couple of seasons, not since we saw Josh Potter and Josh Wanamaker join Radke in the backfield, Marcus Johnson in the, the receiver position two years ago. Last year, Radke played wide receiver because this team didn't have threats, and we see some young guys emerging. Barca's the lead back as an underclassman. Bailey and Bracey emerging out of this young team. And uh, I think Coach Bloom found himself another linebacker in Tyron Bynum. 13 tackles, 2.5 for, lo for losses last week against St. Vincent. You combine him with Doak Walker Jr., Jake Elk. Mm -hmm. I I'm really excited about that position group for Teal. And, and Teal certainly is a team like Grove City, to me, that is, is steadily improving from the output we saw last season. Well, you said that uh, you like the position group of the linebacking core for Teal. And, I mean, Bethany relies a lot in the running game, you know, that might be your matchup to watch is the run defense of Teal against the run offense of Bethany, uh, especially since you mentioned earlier. And statistically speaking, Bethany relies a ton on their run offense. And if you're, you're Teal, you said you felt, Andy, you said you, they fell behind last week. You can't do that against this Bethany defense. They're very good. I look for Teal to try to get out in front early on and try to hold a lead here against Bethany. Also, a key for Bethany offensively is that first-year starter, Chase Keeneman. You, usually with a starter, you kind of ease him into it. You said he only has a couple passes over five yards. We'll see if he has a breakout game this time, getting two starts under his belt, see what he can do, and hopefully lead these Bison to a victory for them. Yeah, you're looking for yards per pass attempt to get up over six yards, and here at Waynesburg, that's something we're looking for Jake Doherty to do as well consistently, mm -hmm. but when you see that that under five yards per attempt, that, that is a red flag that goes up in terms of what you're able to do and pass the ball down the field. A couple of things I look for in this game, Teal is still a young football team under Coach Bloom. Last season, the Tomcats beat Allegheny College in week one and then lost eight in a row before catching Grove City in the season finale and lost by at least 35 points the first five games after week one. I don't think this Teal team is in that same position or will will be not as competitive like it was last year. I, I, I find reasons to be optimistic with Radke as the full-time starter on this team. And I look to the secondary as well. Things are getting better. Trey Andrews, John Barkley each had an interception. That's five on the year for uh, Teal and Bethany. Seven interceptions in the season, two last week as, as well. Those are the top two teams in the PAC in terms of interceptions. They've been opportunistic defensively, and both teams are plus six in turnover margin. Bethany, 10 takeaways. Teal, six takeaways for the Tomcats themselves. And they're extremely similar teams if you look at their red zone numbers, turnover margin, time of possession, third down defense. Very, very similar in all of those categories. One, one thing to look out for, and, and this goes back to, to Donovan Hayden and that Bethany defense, nine sacks for Bethany, second in the PAC, Ryan Radke's a mobile quarterback, and he might be as good as anyone in the conference. It, it might be just him and Rob Kuda in terms of keeping plays alive, making plays with his legs. And we'll see if, if Daniel Gibson on that defensive line, Charles Blango, Donovan Hayden can chase him around all day and make life tough, difficult for uh, young Ryan Radke in Greenville, Pennsylvania. But we will move on to another 1 o'clock matchup. This one in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A Waynesburg University Yellow Jacket football team that we all know very well here at Waynesburg, traveling to CMU to take on Carnegie Mellon and the Tartans. It's the first regular season between, meeting between these two teams since 1963. The Yellow Jackets and Tartans met in a bowl game in 2012 in which Waynesburg won 28-24, but nobody from that 10-win team for Waynesburg is back in a playing capacity any longer. A couple of players, Carter Hill, John Sikora, Zach Kappen, are all members of the Yellow Jackets staff at this point but no one from that game remains from, from the Waynesburg side, at least. However, there is a familiarity between these two teams. Talking with Coach Shepis this week, obviously Waynesburg scrimmages CMU for the last 11 years before this year. 
and uh, they consider each other, they know each other quite well. CMU coming off a of bye week, Waynesburg coming off a loss against Westminster. Zach, what do you see in this matchup? Honestly, I'm looking at Waynesburg's offense, and really, they haven't had the rushing yards they've had in the last couple of years. Last week, their top rusher had 36 yards. On the year in total, they only have 189 through the first two games. So it's not really the ground-and-pound offense we've seen from Waynesburg over the last couple of years with Jerry Lom and Willie Lavelle. They're all gone. So you're looking for someone really to take control of the offense. Jake Dockerty has been under a lot of pressure these last couple of weeks, having to throw the ball more and more. And I think that's really gotten Waynesburg into trouble. So we'll see if this week if we can have a rushing leader really jump out for Waynesburg. And also on the CMU side, they're running back Sam Banger, the top in terms of rushing yards this year, 251 through one game. So it's going to be key for Waynesburg to be able to stop him. Waynesburg's D-line going to have to stack the box and hopefully close up some holes. Yeah, I don't see this as a horrible result for Waynesburg this past week. Losing 28-7, to it looks not great. But I was talking to RG, uh, RJ Leon, who's the backup punter of Waynesburg, uh, just in passing. And he was like, listen... We gave up a couple big plays, and that's the difference in this game, really. Uh, Waynesburg drove a, a lot during this game. They had some good opportunities. They weren't able to turn them into scoring opportunities. But Waynesburg certainly held their own, especially when two touchdowns for Westminster went for 78 yards. And, and, uh, and I mean, that's huge. And then they had a two-play 54-yard drive as well, and that's huge as well. So that kind of pulled the game away for Westminster. Those were the... Uh, second and fourth or I'm sorry third and fourth touchdowns for them um, but one thing I'm interested in and I, I don't know if I'm just looking into it a little bit too much but Jake Doherty running the ball is not that bad I think that is something to keep in mind if Jake Doherty as you mentioned earlier Andy that's something we want to see Jake Doherty improve upon is the yards per attempt in the passing game. He only had just over 100 yards passing last week. If he can open up things with his legs a little bit, use a little bit of his athleticism and mobility to his advantage, I'm not saying he can get up there like Rob Kuda or Ryan Radke even, but maybe that would add another dimension to this Waynesburg offense that has, has had some trouble moving the ball in the early weeks thus far. Yeah, if Doherty is able to get mobile, that could help out this young Waynesburg offensive line. You only had two returning starters on the O-line, a couple of young guys in there. So if you can get Doherty moving around, that puts a little bit of pressure off the O-line, and they can really focus on blocking their guys and keeping Doherty on, on his feet. And remember, you do have a young backfield as well. Uh, so th there's just a lot of young, inexperienced positions right now all around on the Waynesburg offense. And it, it's created problems thus far, but I think it's time, you know, you can be creative a little bit if you want to. Waynesburg has to deal with a rested squad for, from CMU. Coach Lackner's guys off last week. And really, CMU 0-1 in a game much like Thomas Moore's Week 1 game. I think CMU certainly played well enough to win against Washington and St. Louis, and it just slipped away. CMU led 21 to nothing after the first quarter. Washington would score 20 straight points, two touchdowns, two field goals. Washington took a 26-24 lead with under four minutes to play in the third quarter. Both teams exchanged punts. CMU goes on a 14-play, 75-yard touchdown drive that lasts five minutes, ends with Sam Banger's third touchdown run of the day. Washington throws an interception in CMU territory. Tartans go on another five-minute drive that ends in a field goal to go up eight points, 34-26. Washington gets the ball back with 335 left, doesn't do anything with it. CMU gets eight yards on the third and nine, has to punt it away. Washington takes over with 152 left, faces a fourth and two, gets it, faces a fourth and ten, gets it. J.J. Tomlin finds Hammerlund for a 19-yard touchdown for Washington. CMU can still win the game with a defensive stop. Doesn't. And then you go to overtime. Washington goes backwards in overtime, facing a third and 14 from the CMU 29. Touchdown pass. CMU gets inside the Washington 5 after just three plays, but can't convert a third and three and a fourth and two from inside the 5-yard line with the, leading nation, or the, 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 the nation's leading rusher from a season ago. So, so many things had to go wrong for CMU to drop that yeah. week one game. And they've had a whole week off to look back on that game and find all the areas where they could improve and uh, make adjustments and, and just get better. And it'll be a motivated CMU team. Sam Banger, what can you say? 42 carries, 250 yards, three touchdowns, only four negative plays all day, just five yards lost rushing on 42 carries. That's unreal. And he averaged six yards a carry. That, that's what sticks out to me the most about Sam Banger is the fact that he averaged six yards per carry on 42 carries. And it's not a surprise. It's <laughs> Who's going to get right. the football? <laughs> but, I mean, that is their offense. And 
And it's also nice, though, Brian Jangro didn't have a bad day either. 14 to 27. He did throw two picks, uh, 253 yards and a touchdown. So they can mix it up a little bit, which is key for this CMU team. And I think you hit the nail on the head to keep using that phrase, Andy, uh, that this is a game that Carnegie Mellon should have won. And not should have won because they're a better team, but I think they put themselves in a very good position to win this game. As you mentioned, a lot of things had to go wrong for CMU to lose, and they only lost in overtime. And when you said that it was exactly like the Thomas More game, I completely agree. When I saw the box score, that's the first thing I thought of was Thomas More. But I think that Carnegie Mellon is is it's going to be tough uh, for the Waynesburg for the Waynesburg defense to control Sam Banger. Of course, they've got somewhat balanced offense with Jangro as the quarterback. Uh, so it's going to be a tough test for sure for Waynesburg. And as you mentioned already, Carnegie Mellon coming off a bye. Uh, so it's going to be it's going to be good game I think for uh, Carnegie Mellon. Brian Corey, preseason All American defensive end, seven tackles, four for loss, two sacks. Ethan Anderson, 10 tackles for CMU last week. Drew Fitzmorris, an All-American honorable mention last year, led the conference in picks, named all conferences, both a defensive back and a return guy, did not play week one for CMU. That's a storyline to watch as this season continues. And I do want to touch on Waynesburg and, and that offense. Just 11 total first downs, 209 yards of total offense. And Brendan, you mentioned they did have some drives, seven drives into Westminster territory exactly. that netted zero points. The only time Waynesburg got on the board was when the defense recovered a fumble in the Westminster 25 and Waynesburg was able to sneak in the only score that Westminster's allowed all season. And and for Waynesburg, the one guy on this offense that had a really good year last year, all PAC, one of the, the top five or six receivers was Kevin Barnes, who just has six receptions on this year on 21 targets, three catches for 21 or three catches for 20 yards last week. He's a guy that, that they really need a little bit more out of, and, and they're looking for ways to get him the ball. But talking to Coach Shepis, that's a guy who gets a lot of attention from defenses. Of and with the injury to Tim Cooper, you've got inexperience in other cases. Mitch Kendra is coming up for the Waynesburg, and you've seen a couple of other guys get time. But that's certainly a storyline to watch as well. Can this jacket passing game get going? Because through two weeks, it has not been pretty. Yeah, you talked about it. When Kevin Barnes gets the ball in his hands, he can do amazing things with it. He's an incredible athlete. Just hasn't been getting it this year, so we'll see if Doherty can get it to him. For me, the big key is going to be if they can get some rushing yards in this game. Like we said, the leading rusher last week for Waynesburg only had 36 yards of offense on the day, so we'll see if they can have someone step up in that backfield and get it done for Waynesburg. We move on to our next matchup. First PAC conference game that counts, and it's two teams that won last week. Geneva traveling to St. Vincent, a 1 p.m. kickoff in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Last season, this was a, a good football game. St. Vincent won 34-27 to in St. Vincent. Tyler Donahue ran for 135 yards, two touchdowns, threw for another 148 and a touchdown without an interception for the win. And St. Vincent led 14-0 to start the game. Geneva battled back to tie the game at 20 in the third and 27 points in the fourth. But a Chavante Craft touchdown run gave St. Vincent the lead. Geneva was able to drive to the St. Vincent 39, but then a holding penalty on a big 18-yard run by Aaron Channing set the Golden Tornadoes back, and they filled on a 4th and 24, allowing St. Vincent to hold on for the win. And as far as guys who are coming back this season that had an impact in that game, Javid Ellis, 108 yards on the ground for a with a touchdown, 13 for 28, 190 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, played the first three quarters before getting knocked out and having Channing go in. And Geneva outgained St. Vincent last season, 423 to 392. Nick Cook, seven catches, 109 yards, and a touchdown. He's gone. Like just about every week this season, Geneva's a completely different team in 2016. Coach DeMarco reinventing the squad in the triple option, able to beat Bethany 21 0 under the lights at Reeves Field last week. And St. Vincent, of course, 32 30 winners against Teal. So something's got to give here. Both teams' winners a week ago. What do we see in this matchup? For Geneva, as you said, yeah, they have that whole revamped offense this year with the triple option. First two weeks trying to get used to it, picking up the first win with it a week ago. And with St. Vincent, St. Vincent's a team, again, that has a lot of athleticism offensively. Derek Stewart, second in the PAC so far, 649 passing yards on the season. So Stewart's really going to be a factor for St. Vincent in this ball game. Geneva's defense is going to have to step up and try to stop the passing game of St. Vincent. They're going to try to go for the big plays, and we'll see what happens. i got to see Geneva's defense step up to see if they can beat them. Yeah, and I think that's the key of the game is can 
Geneva's defense limit the big playability of St. Vincent's offense. You look at a guy like Shavante Kraft, who had 24 carries last week for 111 yards. He had three touchdowns. And Derek Stewart, while he wasn't as effective in last in this past week's game as he was in week number one, he still had an efficient day, uh, 20 of 31, 225 yards and a TD. So St. Vincent's passing game and rushing game seems to be clicking at this point. And Geneva just played against uh, Bethany, and Bethany has been struggling on offense. Geneva's triple option, while yes, it is reinvented, it's still pretty new. Uh, and t you have to remember, Geneva only got the 21 points uh, in the fourth All quarter. All in the fourth quarter. All in the fourth quarter. So, obviously, scoreless through the first three. And this is not a game that Geneva can play punch for punch with uh, for St. Vincent. I think St. Vincent's got a ton of firepower on offense. So, Geneva's defense, as you mentioned, Zach, will need to step up and play a really solid game. It's a different challenge this week defensively for the Golden Tornadoes. They're mm -hmm. not at home under the lights. Bethany was starting a first-year starter with a conservative passing attack that's still dealing with life after Eric Blinn. Jalen Holmes got his to an extent, but didn't break the game open. St. Vincent has big play receivers, a good back, and a quarterback that, that seems to have earned the trust from Coach Dolciato. A storyline to watch for St. Vincent for sure is, is, is Derek Stewart for real? Mm -hmm. Last season, we thought St. Vincent had the guy in Evan Shemensky. Coach Dolciato went away from him as the season went on, went to Tyler Donahue. Donahue became PAC Newcomer of the Year. Donahue no longer with the program. So Derek Stewart through two weeks. You mentioned this, Zach. Second in passing through two weeks. Leads the conference in completions. Second in attempts. Those numbers tell me that he has the trust of Coach Dolciato. And with St. Vincent, they have the weapons. They've had guys there for a couple of years now. DJ Ocean Kelly, six catches, 84 yards. Damon Black, six catches, 75 yards, and a touchdown. Derek Stewart's making use of them, and Shavante Kraft is returning to the form we saw him two seasons ago. Over 100 yards on the ground, over four and a half yards of carry. St. Vincent started fast, scoring touchdowns on the first three drives, including a 10-play, 83-yard drive, a 15-play, 77-yard drive that lasted almost five and a half minutes. And at the end of the day, special teams play under Coach Dolciato has been excellent at St. Vincent year after year after year now in his third season. And Damon Black, Special Teams Player of the Week, the difference in the game against Teal, a blocked extra point return for two. And on the other side for Geneva, we talk about the defense last week. John Fiscus, linebacker for Geneva, nine total tackles, force fumbled, career high in sacks and tackles for loss, one and a half sacks, four tackles for loss. It has to be that again for the Golden Tornadoes. They're still, and th this is an every week thing too, Teams must prepare specifically for Geneva and their attack, but Geneva, they're only two weeks in, now three weeks into running this new offense, and, and this is a game where I feel like they wore down Bethany. Scoreless into the fourth, seven straight rushing plays, a roughing the passer penalty, and then you get your first touchdown run. The defense gets a stop, gets a takeaway on an interception. Austin Marizio returns an interception inside the Bethany red zone. They score again with Devin Koloski. All of a sudden, you're up two scores. Bethany goes backwards the next drive. Geneva goes 64 yards on nine plays to put it away. And Geneva holding Bethany to just 11 first downs, 216 yards of total offense. You look at John Fiscus. You look at Jimmy Quinlan, who's been there for a while. Jimmy Quinlan, double-digit tackles, 11, one and a half tackles for stops. And then four fourth down stops for this Geneva defense. A blocked field goal. Held Chase Keenman to under three yards of passing attempt. And Trayvon Marshall, 130 yards on the ground. Uh, Monteloni, two carries, 34 yards, a touchdown, a big punt return, and then Koloski, a touchdown as well. It's cliche to say that Geneva found a way to win, but they played to their strengths, kept right. Bethany under control, didn't have to play from behind. That's where things Huge. can really get dicey. Exactly. Because the, the passing game isn't there yet. Isn't there yet in the triple option. Still just only a couple of completions, more interceptions than, than touchdowns. No, no touchdown passes yet this year for Geneva in that. But I think that's something that comes with time. Two for 10, 36 yards, two interceptions out of Ellis and Koloski combined. But as far as this game, these are two teams coming off of wins and two teams that, that certainly want to start the PA season right in, in this matchup. And, I mean, for Geneva, the key for me is going to be that offense. They can't wait till the fourth quarter to score like they did last week. 21 points all coming in the fourth quarter. you got to get something early so your defense isn't under pressure to stop this St. Vincent offense. St. Vincent's, we've talked about, has big play potential. And their defense, Geneva's defense, is going to have to keep them under control. So we'll see if the Geneva offense can get some points early and often to try to really get them going in this game. 
Geneva last in total offense, second in total defense. Is that a sustainable business model is the question for Coach DeMarco's squad. We shall see. And how will Geneva continue to improve with its triple threat? Will it be able to hold the ball for 35 minutes like it did against Bethany? I'm, I'm interested in this matchup. This is one of those where two teams that won last week in Geneva as well as St. Vincent. And then in the matchup with Teal and Bethany, the two teams that lost last week getting together so some some interesting games pitting the teams in, in the middle of the PAC against each other of course you've got the teams at the top going against each other as well in Thomas Moore and WJ but we'll shift gears to our final matchup of the week and it's the only one under the lights in Grove City Pennsylvania Case Western Reserve traveling to Grove City Case Western 1-0 Grove City 0-2 Case Western coming off the bye week Grove City coming off a loss to WJ and Case hasn't played Grove City College since joining the PAC as an affiliate member. Grove City hasn't won a game since Case Western has been a part of the conference. But for Coach DiDonato, the early schedule hasn't been a kind one. Last week, all PAC second team guy, potential All-American guy this year in, in Pete Coughlin. This week, he's got all PAC first team guy from a season ago in Rob Kuda. So uh, a tall order. Talking to Coach DiDonato, he's looking for progress out of his guys. It's certainly a tall challenge when you look at Case Western Reserve. Yeah, and since this Case Western team's joined the PAC, they had a little rough patch their first year, but they've really come on, especially last season, to be a real powerhouse here in the PAC, and part of that's been Rob Kuda. It doesn't have the lofty numbers that he's had in years past. does lead the league in passing completion percentage with 81% of his passes completed on the day, but Kuda's really been the key to this Case Western offense, especially last season, now early into this season. So we'll see how Kuda's able to perform against the Grove City team, who really hasn't been competitive over these last couple of years, trying to rise and hopefully give Case Western at least a little bit of a challenge in this one. Yeah, Grove City struggled tremendously against W and J on the defensive side of things. Uh, there was, uh, other than a interception, there was uh, ten straight touchdown drives for. Or I'm sorry, eight straight touchdown drives for W and J last week against Grove City, and that uh, I mean that you're just not going to win ba football games that way. Very few teams can go punch for punch with W and J, and it's not surprising. And I think the same. One thing that can be said about Grove City is that if you had told Grove City that they were going to score 13 points in the first quarter, I think they would have liked that. The problem was is that W and J scored 30. So now it's combining solid offense and trying to keep Rob Kuda off the field as best as you can, and that's going to be extremely difficult to do. And when he is on the field, can you contain him? And since he is such a dual threat kind of guy, I, his first week of the season against Chicago, 17 to 21, 217 yards in a touch in two touchdowns. That's only that's through the air, and he had 19 rushes for 125 yards and two touchdowns great on the ground. That's immaculate. That's that's hard to defend. That's extremely difficult to defend if you're Grove City. So you have to figure out a way to keep him off the field as long as possible. You have to sustain drives somehow, some way, and just keep taking time off the clock. And that's what I'm going to look for for Grove City if they want to try to win this game. Well, for Grove City, again, talking to Coach this week, really it was a learning experience against WJ against a very good offensive football team. <laughs> when you have breakdowns, they will score every time. Mm -hmm. And 30 points in the first quarter, 28 points in the second quarter, and you talk about staying on the field, Brendan. It was really the big plays for W&J. W&J only possessed the ball for 2 minutes and 38 seconds in the first quarter and came away with 30 points. Yeah. That, that, that tells me that it was the explosive plays down the field for W&J, and that, that's something that this Grove City team needs to improve upon. However, I, I see out of Grove City a guy in Nick Ponikvar who leads the PAC in receptions, who had another nice day last week, 5 catches, 60 yards, and a touchdown. You have a freshman running back in Wesley Schools who went over 100 yards against W&J and really his second, his second ever game and his first real chance to shine for Grove City. And then Brett LaFoon, 115 yards, a touchdown, two interceptions. That's the first time he's played against a, a top 25 program in the country. He went from, from quad A high school football in, in which he led a, a Penn Trafford team to the Hines Field to play in the WPIL uh, championship game. But WJ is a whole other animal. Mm. Uh, a top 25 program, consistently the best that this conference has to offer. A young football team against a young football team on both sides of the ball that that's still looking for uh, progress in the process. And like Thomas Moore in week one against Franklin, Grove City's defense likely won't face a better passing attack. 
for the entire rest of the season with Coglin and Zubik and company. And I certainly look for, for progress out of this team, especially these young skill position guys who were good enough in, in training camp, in preseason, to prove themselves. And they're starting here day one for Grove City. Now, on the other side, you have Case Western Reserve. And they're a team that, that was very impressive in week one. Like Westminster, just took care of business, beat Chicago 45-17. Case led 21-3 just three minutes into the second quarter and never looked back. The offense scored four touchdowns in the, on the first three drives. On, or they scored four touchdowns in the first three drives in the season. The offense with three of them. Justin Fan runs back a punt, 85 yards for a touchdown. All three first-half scoring drives last at least 10 plays, 69, 79, 80 yards, chewing up 506, 444, 517 on the clock. These are big, long drives, all longer than Chicago's longest drive by over a minute. Mm. And, and Case Western, clean game, no turnovers, 8 for 13 on third down. Held Chicago to 5 for 16 on third down. Held Chicago 0 for 2 on fourth down. Rob Kuda's day, fantastic. 200 yards passing, uh, 125 rushing, four total touchdowns. And I, I like what they have going in the backfield now for Case Western. Junior Anthony Miles, 12 carries, 73 yards. I love the fact that he got six yards a carry, and I love the fact that he never went backwards. No negative rushing plays. It, it tells me that the offensive line is doing its job. It takes some pressure off Rob Kuda and Brendan, Brendan Lynch is a guy who's coming back seven catches, 76 yards, a couple of touchdowns. Yeah. Justin Fan, four catches, 62 yards, a punt return touchdown. And Case Western, the big question for the Spartans coming into the season, replacing six guys in that 34 front that Coach Debelak likes to use, shut down Chicago's running game, second in the PAC in rush defense, holding opponents to 100 yards, 3.1 yards a carry, and replacing six of the front seven from last year. That That is phenomenal. And Nick Kwan in the secondary, a guy they can count on three passes defended, it is a challenge this week for Grove City, and uh, I will say this, for the Wolverines at least, playing at home, they play one night game a year, it's a special, special night, and for Geneva last week, it didn't look good coming off week one's loss to Frostburg State, but they were able to get it together, play a good football game, and come away with a win. And for Grove City, I think they're going to have to be very particular about how they go about this game if they want to come away with a victory. I'm going to say from personal experience, playing under the lights always amps up the game a little bit, no matter how good or bad you are. So we'll see if maybe this 7 o'clock game can help Grove City. You talked about their young guys on offense playing the W&J team last week, the cream of the crop of the PAC. That's always a good learning experience for Grove City. They know they've gotten over that biggest hump of the season they're going to have to go through. So now they get a chance to face a team that's still good but not as good as W&J and see if what they've learned from last week has really transitioned to this week. I'm looking for Grove City to at least fight here against Case Western. Even a close game is a win for Grove City for me. Uh, I think you said it perfectly early on, earlier on in the segment, Zach, when you said if you are Grove City, you have to look to just keep this a competitive football game. And I think that's true. It's a tough draw having to play W&J and Case Western to, in the first three weeks of the season. I mean, th th those are two of the best teams in the PAC, flat out. And PA, and uh, they're going to see a whole another uh, animal in Rob Kuda who can burn you on the ground and through the air. So... You know, Andy, as you mentioned last, uh, you kind of responded to me wanting to keep Rob Kuda off the field if you're Grove City, but it was the long plays that hurt them against W and J. They can't get long plays if Rob Kuda's off the field. I understand that they struggled with the long plays, and they're going to have to find a way to fix that. But if you can play the laws of averages, that probably won't happen all the time. They'll probably figure that out. So if you can just keep him off the field and get your offense in position, just... Uh, to keep getting first downs, you don't need to you don't need to punch the ball in all the time. Keep getting first downs, control the clock, and anything can happen. And I'll say this for Grove City: I really like the Wolverines' chances to wake the, to break that winless streak that they have going, dating back to November of 2013. Even even if it isn't early in the season with the tough schedule that they have after Junietta College, I, I see down the stretch. Uh, Geneva, Bethany, Teal, Waynesburg are all games that I think the Grove City team will be in. I know Coach DiDonato in talking to him is, is consumed with just getting better every day, following the clear vision that he has, and I think the Wolverines will be rewarded at least once throughout this season. But we thank you for joining us for the PAC pregame show. As always, tune in next week to the Football Focus as we highlight the Geneva Golden Tornadoes and head coach Gino DeMarco, only here on PACathletics.org.